The Idris Shah Foundation Podcast. Practical psychology for today. Featuring the works of Idris Shah, narrated by David Ott. Welcome to the Idris Shah Foundation Podcast. During his lifetime, Idris Shah promoted contacts and connections between different traditions around the world, believing this to be an important element in the advancement of human culture. In this spirit, the Idris Shah Foundation has created Cultural Crossroads, a website forum where people from many walks of life are invited to talk about their own experiences crossing cultural boundaries and the lessons that they have learnt as a result. You can find these articles on the ISF blog. This is our third Cultural Crossroads interview for this podcast. Professor of Anthropology Wade Davis is a true polymath who has made substantial contributions in at least four significant areas. Aged only 20, he completed a traverse of the Darien Gap with British explorer Sebastian Snow. He then became an ethnobotanist under the tutelage of Dr. Richard Schultz and went on to discover the zombie poison used in voodoo rituals in Haiti. This led him towards anthropology and the study of shamanic practices all over the world. It also led to a Hollywood film based on his exploits in Haiti, the marvellous Serpent and the Rainbow, titled after his own account of his time there. He is an explorer-in-residence at National Geographic, as well as a photographer and documentary filmmaker. He is also a qualified river rafting guide. At the same time, he has pursued a career as a non-fiction writer on a variety of subjects, including an investigation of the 1924 Everest attempt and its links to the collective trauma of World War I. Here, Dr. Davis talks to Robert Twigger about exploration, the need to take risks in life, and a preview of his new fascinating book about Colombia. He starts by talking about his time with British explorer Sebastian Snow. At that point in my life, I was only 20 years old, and I really only had one word in my vocabulary for any experience, and that was yes. Right. And uh, it was really quite serendipitous. I had come back from the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta, where I'd spent several weeks with my mentor and friend, Tim Plowman, who was going back to Cambridge to get his um, PhD at the convocation. So I sort of had a month off, and I came back to the Medellin Botanical Garden, and there was a geography there uh, who had worked in the Choco extensively and Sebastian who had a deal with the London I think it was a Sunday observer to walk from the tip of Tierra del Fuego and he's going to walk to Alaska and the only place along that trajectory where there was not a paved road was the traverse of the Darien Gap and he had sort of contacted through the embassy um, Michael uh, who had agreed to guide him through that forest and Michael, in a very kind of a flippant way, asked me if I was interested in walking across some swamps for a couple of days. And I, of course, said yes. And we actually met. I met Sebastian in Apartado, yeah. uh, north of Medellin. And I immediately realized how utterly uh, unprepared and ill-equipped he was. I mean, <laughs> he, he, he was clearly one of these Englishmen who went looking for chaos or trouble in order to have something to write about. Uh, <laughs> you know, one of the engineers we met in the Darien uh, asked him why he had done this, walking from the tip of Tierra del Fuego um, with the goal of walking to Alaska. And in a kind of one of Sebastian's sort of few poetic phrases, he said it was sort of an ongoingness into a never endingness. <laughs> and the engineer cut him off and says and said, you know, mate, it seems to me more like going from nowhere to nowhere and seeing how long it takes you. And there was that quality to Sebastian's um, mania. You know, he he took pride in the fact that he had walked all that distance, the length of South America, without learning a single phrase in Spanish. He he literally still (laughs) said that if you speak the Queen's English loud enough, anyone will understand. And part of this goes back to his own very moving origins in a way. You know, he, he went to Eton, yeah. And he broke his thigh playing rugby. And so while all of his other school mates went off to fight and many to die in Hitler's war, he had been told he'd never be able to walk again. And so he had this almost kind of 
pathological need to show that that was not the case. And he, he began by responding to an advertisement in the London Times, looking for someone to join a geological survey to search for the so-called head of the Amazon. And they settled on the upper Wyaga River in Peru, which was actually not the head of the Amazon. It turns out to be the upper reaches of the Apurimac. But needless to say, when the expedition turned around and went west to Lima, a distance of a couple of hundred miles, Sebastian, as a young lad, said, I think I'll go the other way. And he sort of famously made his way walking, rafting, whatever, uh, eventually taking boats, I suppose, the length of the Amazon. And he wrote a book called My Amazon Adventure in the early 1950s. And this began a series of journeys, you know, walking across here, walking across there. And, you know, it was kind of poignant because, you know, there is that great literary tradition of the Englishman out of his element, and no one can do it like the Brits. And people like Eric Newby and his wonderful book, A Short Walk in the Hindu Kush, come to mind. Yeah. You know, that fantastic self-deprecating, understated, understated um, humor that really only the Brits can seem to pull off. But when it doesn't work, it falls very flat. And I think that's <laughs> sort of happened to Sebastian, you know. And he was on that sort of periphery of that Blashford Snell. I mean, Chris Bonington was a friend of his. Chris went out to walk some of the distance in Ecuador and was just immediately bored with staying on the tarmac and took off over land. Sebastian just had this obsession. Yeah. And uh, so having met him, I immediately went back to Medellin to get some supplies, modest supplies, but at least an anti-venom, you know, snake bite kit, um, yeah. a little bit of food. Uh, I can't even remember what I what I went back to secure. But then I joined him <clears throat> and Michael uh, in this tiny little place called Barrancalitos, which was the last jumping off point to the Cienega del Rio Trato. Now, now, Sebastian had this crazy deal with the observer that he wouldn't form, take any form of transportation. So even to approach the Darien, we had to traverse in the rainy season the wetlands of the Cienega del Rio Trato. So the first couple of days, um, you know, it implied Sebastian walking up to his neck, you know, through these flood <laughs> forks and so on. Just crazy. I mean, you know, just for the sake of being able to do it. Yeah. And uh, But the night before we embarked, there was a tremendous thunderstorm cracked open the sky. And I remember a little old local woman looked to me and said, Gringuito, you're hair is brown, your eyes are blue, too bad everything will be yellow by the time you reach Panama. <laughs> and then, to my horror, Michael, I think, feigned a malaria attack, and he dropped out on the very eve of our departure, and leaving me, um, and the reason I say feigned the attack, because when we finally got through, uh, and I finally ran into Michael back at the Botanical Garden in Medellin, I could just see from the look on his face that he had been in tremendous um, anxiety for some time. Because after all, he had, you know, to avoid, I think, going on this sort of silly adventure himself, he had sort of shanghaied me as a young, yeah. naive 20-year-old Canadian. I was happy to do it, but in retrospect, thinking back now as a professor and looking at some of these young 20-year-old kids who come into my classes... It was a pretty, um, one could almost say, cowardly thing for him to do. Yeah. And uh, that said, I, I, I was all for it, and I leapt into the experience with abandon, and I'm very grateful to Sebastian for having made that possible because it involved a series of um, memorable experiences, adventures that really honed the, the dimensions of my, my life. Now, when we finally got through after all, all these misadventures that became almost surrealistic uh, from, you know, running into black jaguar on the trail to having people chase us into the forest, to having missionaries try to convert me and, you know, missionaries who claimed in all sincerity that they truly believed. And, and this, of course, was in the immediate wake of the 1973 Yom Kippur War that they really believed that Henry Kissinger was the second coming of Christ. I mean, that meant to me that there were at least two people in the world who thought that. And, um, and you know, we got through finally to the other side, much worse for the wear. Sebastian started walking north, and I, and I caught a little plane to Panama City, 
and I landed in Panama City, and I had been squeezed into the into the uh, passenger list, so I was in the far back of this small Cessna, and this young girl beside me in this tremendous turbulence puked all over my lap. <laughs> and the mother who was in front turned to console her daughter. She vomited as well on me. So I arrived in Panama City at the age of 20 with $3 to my name, a passport and a sleeve in my leather boot, the only clothes on my back, drenched in vomit, <laughs> and yet I had never felt more alive. So I, I thank Sebastian for that. Now, what happened to him is he rested in Panama City, where his uncle or cousin was a British ambassador, and then he began um, his journey north again, uh, walking, and one of his friends, I think it was Julian Tennant, came out from England to walk with him for a few days, and to their mutual horror, neither man recognized the other. And so Julian, I think it was Julian, got Sebastian into a hospital, and then in the middle of the night, in his pajamas, Sebastian got up and started to walk north. And that was that, and they bundled, bundled him back to Britain. And I don't think he ever really recovered. My father and I visited him in, in a journey my dad and I did just before my own father died. And, and we met him in a pub in Devon, and he clearly had seen better days. So I think, you know, that there, you know, life's like that, isn't it? I mean, you know, you never, you never know when someone's life reaches the apex of the yeah, yeah. curve and, and then begins a slow descent. And, I think I think Sebastian, you know, tried to be a great explorer, or he tried he tried to be a writer, but he couldn't really be either, and and he became kind of almost a caricature of himself, which was very sad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He certainly, yeah, sort of faded away after that, definitely. But did that? I mean, a taste for adventure, which you definitely needed for the the project that you you undertook in Haiti. I mean, certainly that's, you know, one of the most extraordinary ethnobotanical adventures of, 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 well, you know, of the century. A lot of, this, you know, um, a lot of this comes down to, you know, we all are products of our upbringing and the influences of our youth. And I, you know, I grew up in a very, very uh, modest uh, suburb of Montreal in, in, in a very loving family, but not a family that was going to light the world on fire. And I just had, I think, at the strongest, the strongest sense that, um, I wasn't going to, I was going to obviously gain values from my family, my father in particular, but I wasn't going to learn from my father or from that environment. And I, at some level, um, realized I simply had to begin to jump off cliffs. And I think one of the great lessons of life, as Terence McKenna always quipped, was that, you know, you jump off the cliff and to your delight, you don't land on rocks, but on a feather bed, because the world in many ways, exists to lift you up, not to put you down. And I had that sense of things because my mother, a modest but determined Canadian woman, had told me in 1968 when I was only 14 that Spanish was a language of the future. And she saved all years and a secretary to a principal in a modest elementary school to allow me to join a group of schoolboys that an English te that a Spanish teacher was um, taking to Colombia. And, you know, in 1968, most Brits and most Americans and most Canadians had never been in an airplane. Yeah. And so the Colombian destination was quite exotic. And I was very fortunate that I was billeted with a modest family in the mountains, whereas the other lads tended to be with more affluent families in, in the um, rich neighborhoods of the city. And whereas many of the older lads felt what the Colombians called mamitis, you know, homesick. Yeah. I felt like I'd finally found home. So I had this sort of sense of jumping off cliffs from the earliest age as not just something I wanted to do, but something that I just viscerally had to do if I wasn't going to drown in the kind of what I perceived at the time in the 1960s as a kind of a sea of bourgeois mediocrity. And I say that not in judgment of my parents, but just as a statement of the world into which I happened to be born. And so that notion of, you know, saying yes to new experiences, uh, began at the youngest age. You know, I was fighting forest fires in British Columbia at 16. I was um, working logging camps. I was, you know, in the bush, uh, self-sufficient, um, in the orbit of older men, uh, often tough men. Um, and so I, I had that kind of, that DNA, if you will. And so 
when Sebastian says, you know, do you want to walk across the Darien? Of course I can walk across the Darien. I mean, you know, I mean, Christmas, I, I played rugby at Brentwood College. If you play rugby at Brentwood College, you can do anything. You know, <laughs> you know I mean, it literally, I mean, yeah. I once told the coach that. I mean, we, you know, we grew up in Canada, and Canada's a place where the weight of the wild hovers in the imagination. And, you know, I mean, you know, where I lived in Canada, you know, even now, you know, I could throw England and English would never find it. You know, it's just a different world over here. Yeah. And you grew up that way, you know, and I'm not, I'm not in any way disparaging um, the, the UK, which I adore um, uh, and admire enormously. We, we're all ski owners of the UK, but I just mean that, that um, you, you, you grew up with a you know, you, 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 I grew up with that sense of, of, um, you know, just saying yes to new experiences. And yeah. that's how it kind of propelled my life. And in fact, when I, you know, when I worked for, for four years in the Amazon and the Andes thinking of only plants, um, and, and, uh, indigenous people, yeah. uh, I, I was getting kind of tired. I, I felt like, you know, I collected maybe 6,000 botanical specimens, but, you know, I really, became interested in botany largely as a metaphor, largely as a conduit to culture. You know, if you want to, if you want to, for example, understand the ways of the Inuit people, you have to become a hunter because everything rotates around the hunt. Yeah. And similarly in the Amazon, the obvious conduit to culture as a young anthropologist was a botanical realm. But after being, taking this sort of very deep dive into ethnobotany, after a while, I think because I was an anthropologist, because I wasn't really convinced that Western notions of systematics and taxonomy were as definitive and as reflective of true evolutionary relationships as they might in fact be, I began to feel like I was kind of collecting hay um, every time I made another botanical specimen. And that was a signal that I needed to find another cliff to jump off. And there was always something looming in the fourth floor eerie of Professor Schultes. And in the early 1980s, uh, 1982, in fact, he summoned me in the midst of a miserable Boston winter to his office and sort of casually asked me if I wanted to go down to the island nation of Haiti, uh, what would turn out to be infiltrating the secret societies to secure the formula of a folk poison said to be used to make zombies. And I naturally said yes, <laughs> uh, you know, thinking that it would be a two-week lark when it ended up consuming four years of my life because the reason it's consumed four years of my life is that finally, you know, ethnobotany is a description of an activity in a way more than a science. You know, we collect the plants used by a people. Yes, we try to understand um, the origin of plants, the domestication of cultivated plants. We try to, in, in the case of ethnopharmacology, find compounds that may be of interest to in modern medicine. But it lacked a theoretical focus. It lacked an intellectual gravitas to me, at least as an anthropologist. And yet Voodoo offered this quite opposite opportunity where, you know, the I was sent down to so find the so-called drug used to make zombies. Well, no drug can make a social phenomena. But having been sent down to find the chemical basis of a social event, in a way I found myself exploring the social, cultural, historic, psychological, even spiritual dimensions of a chemical possibility. And so the, the ethno-botanical, or in this case, I suppose the ethno-biological lens opened up ethnographic and political vistas of incredible interest so that, so that in a way, the, the, the most important consequence of my research in Haiti, yes, I came up with a hypothesis. Yes, I identified a natural product in the environment, identified by the uh, the sorcerers, the negative priests, uh, and implicated in using the zombie phenomena that had a compound in it that, if applied in the right way at the right time of year, not only could make people appear to be dead, but had done so many times in the past. Yeah. We knew that was absolutely the case. So, so my whole hypothesis about zombification in terms of ethnopharmacology was based on that correlation. But I always was careful in a way to present that research as a hypothesis, as being provocative, but ultimately perhaps unprovable. But in the course of coming up with those correlations, you know, I suddenly had the whole world of the social structure of Haiti opened up before me. 
the, the Bisa Gauche Emperor Secret Societies, the foundation of François Duvalier's rule, the mechanism by which he created the Tonto Makut, all yeah. of this in the context of Haitian history, including the use of poisons as social sanctions. It goes right back to West Africa. This whole kind of ethnographic historical vista opened up, and I think that's the real contribution of my two books on Haiti, A, revealing those structures that explain Haitian history, and also, and perhaps ultimately more importantly, uh, taking this phenomenon, the Haitian zombie, that had been used in an explicitly racist way to denigrate a people yeah. in their religion, and made sense out of sensation, and in doing so, showing that voodoo is not a magic black magic cult, but it's just a complex metaphysical worldview. It's the religion of West Africa. I mean, it's interesting. I always say to audiences, you know, if I were to ask you to name the great religions of the world, what would you say? Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, whatever. Shintoism, there's always one continent left out, Sub-Saharan Africa. The tacit assumption being that people south of the Sahara had no religious beliefs. Well, of course they did. And voodoo, which is just a fond word from Dahomey, means spirit or God, is simply the distillation of those profound spiritual intuitions. So in that sense, Haiti was so important to me because in so many ways, um, because it really, really taught me yeah. in a visceral sense the truth of Boaz's great revelation about culture, which is cultural relativism, the idea that the world into which you're born is one model of reality, but the other peoples of the world aren't failed attempts at being you. You know, every culture is a unique answer to a fundamental question. What does it mean to be human and alive? And, and the, the people who answer that question, they do so in the 7,000 voices and languages of humanity. And so it really launched me back into a career in anthropology, if you will, where my entire lens became an ethnographic as opposed to an ethnobotanical lens. Now, plants continue to inform everything that I do. I mean, right now, I, I, I suppose, you know, I've always lived by the adage of Picasso, if it works, it's obsolete. And, <laughs> you know, I've, I've always, you know, I've done, I've written 23 books now, and every time a new book comes out, there's some reviewer who says in a review, well, this book is quite a departure for Wade Davis. And they just <laughs> quite get the pattern that every bloody book is a departure because every book is hard to write, and it, you know it's always where your curiosity alights. And so, in that sense, you know, um, I, I think Haiti was a very, very incredibly important transition for me. And of course, because the story was so uh, inherently sensational, it, it gave me that opportunity to break into the world of writing literary nonfiction with yeah. my first. The Serpent of the Rainbow. Yeah. Talking about different books, I mean, the, the last one, I, which I probably, along with the reviewer, thought was an, a departure was the one about Everest, which was fascinating. But what's the what's the latest departure? Do you want to say something about sure, that? Sure, I've just finished them um, literally this morning, actually. I sent in the revised edits to my editor in New York and London. Yeah, some people travel the world always in quest of areas they don't know or new experiences in, in a vulgar sense some people simply collect locations you know or destinations or nations I'm always drawn by the story so I, I never hesitate to go back to a place that I've spent a lot of time and Columbia you know has always been a, a second home to me I think there's something you know we all fall in love with that first nation we visit as travelers a nation that allows us to feel free and, and, and Columbia absolutely was that place but that said as my work straddled the world in the wake of writing the book One River, you know, which was a six-year yeah. engagement in Columbia and the biography of my professor Schultes and so on. You know, my work then, when I was recruited as an explorer in residence of the National Geographic, you know, charged with a mission to, to change the way the world viewed and valued culture in a decade, that launched me in a series of wonderful journeys um, to places around the world, in the ethnosphere, if you will, where the practices and beliefs were so inherently dazzling that we hoped at least that through storytelling, our massive global audience would have the dial shift a little bit as they came to understand that there's no such thing as primitive culture, that that the, the idea that we went from the savage to the barbarian to the civilized to the strand of London is a total colonial conceit of the 19th century, that every culture has something to say, each deserves to be heard, just as none has a monopoly on the route to the divine. That kind of consumed about a decade of, of my life and mm. led to um, 
20, 30 films, number of books. And then just for whatever reason, um, I was drawn back to Columbia and a whole series of things sort of converged to, to uh, like an avalanche to sort of sweep me into the embrace of Columbia once again. And the book that I've written um, is based on five years of research and and traveling the length of the river that is the Mississippi of Columbia, the Rio Magdalena. And the Magdalena, of course, is not just a quarter of commerce. It's a fountain of poetry, a fountain of music. It's, it's a definition. It's, it's, a, it's the artery that allowed the Columbian nation to exist. In fact, I can't think um, of any river in the world, with the possible exception of the Nile, that has literally determined the destiny of a country or civilization more directly and indisputably than the Magdalena in Colombia. Mm. You can't say that about the Mississippi and the States, important as it is. You can't say that about the St. Lawrence in Canada, important as it is. You can't say that about the Thames in London, important as it is. Mm. Um, the, 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 even the Ganga in India, important as it is, the Indus. You just can't say that about that many rivers. Perhaps the Mekong in Southeast Asia, I don't know. But certainly the Magdalena, um, like the Nile, absolutely defines Colombia. And so it was an opportunity to try to present the truth about Colombia. You know, it's so interesting. I mean, here's a nation convulsed by 50 years of war, uh, 220,000 dead, 100,000 missing, uh, and yet, in, in a country of 48 million people, there are never more than 200,000 combatants. So most Colombians have been victims of a war that would not have lasted more than a, a few days, a week, would have fizzled out years ago yeah. had it not been for the fuel of the fire of war, which is cocaine. It's ironic that the, the people who really have the blood of Colombia in their hands is everybody you know who's ever used illicit street cocaine and any country that has prohibited its distribution uh, without doing anything to seriously impede that distribution. And the country that has suffered is Colombia, a place mm. where most Colombians have never seen cocaine, have no interest in cocaine. Mm. And the amount of wealth that was unleashed by the global obsession with cocaine would have shattered any nation. I mean, at one point, the Medellin cartel was budgeting a thousand U.S. dollars a week just to buy elastic bands, <laughs> just to, just to wrap the money in. Right and yet, despite all of that, I mean, how would Americans feel, for example, if there, if Canada's policies and patterns of drug consumption in bars and boardrooms across the country forced 65 million Americans to flee their country? Well, that's what happened in Colombia, proportionately. Right. And yet during all these terrible years, Colombia has maintained democracy and civil society, greened its economy, greened its cities, created millions of acres of national parks and uh, uh, reserves for indigenous people, laid down the foundation for an economic, cultural, and even spiritual renaissance that's never been seen in Latin America. As two generations of young people forced to flee the country are now returning um, and they're returning from the capitals of the world with skill sets and every conceivable endeavor to revitalize their country. So the world may be falling apart, but Colombia is falling together. Oh, wow. And the book is really a love letter to Colombia and the river that has always flowed. For many years it carried the, the bodies of the dead, but now it very much carries the hopes of the living. This podcast is copyright 2018, the Idris Shah Foundation.